we were part of great Baptist churches growing up and was familiar with how the Annie Armstrong offering was put to such incredible use. But growing up in Alabama, it's kind of scary to think that we were going to come out here to try something that we had not done before, that we knew the Lord was calling us to, but didn't want to do it alone. The context here in Las Vegas is much different than the context in Alabama, and one of that is just religious awareness. 60% of our city would identify with no religion at all. And because of that, I think we have a unique opportunity to introduce them to who Jesus is. It really makes me think of Maki's story. I met Maki for the first time. He showed up at one of our events before we launched called an invite night. My name is Maki Pizzolo. I'm a professional MMA fighter, which is a professional mixed martial arts fighter. Um, I never thought that God would love a person that fights and looks towards violence for a living. But before Favorite City Church started, Joseph led me to Christ. And I would say that today, my life is blessed. I couldn't even put it into words. My guy is blessing me left and right, bro. And that, that's, that's legit. I didn't even know church planting was a thing until I met them, but, um, and I'm looking forward to be able to go out and help make more disciples and really turning the tides in people's lives. Yeah, so now we're in a space where we're seeing over 150 people engaging at our church. We've seen over 30 professions of faith. So the freedom that we get from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is that we get to engage with people like my friend, Maki. We get to take our time and then that's where we're able to see the disciple making process happen and the church be born. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to service this morning. I have a few announcements for you. Just a reminder with the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, we have a couple more weeks of that emphasis. So if you continue to pray uh, over the individuals who will be going out and witnessing to those for the gospel of Christ, um, all those individuals who put in the time and the effort that we cannot at the moment, but we uh, certainly support them uh, in any way that we can. We pray for them, we provide financially, we do what we can for those missionaries out in the field, and we certainly are um, grateful for them because there's a lot of times they put their lives on the line. And so we need to remember them, especially during those times as they um, do the things that some of us are not even willing to do at times. So uh, let's continue to pray for them. Hannah, come on up. She's gonna talk to us about the upcoming fundraiser that's coming up. So. Let's give her our attention. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Are you guys all ready for another game show? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So on April 6th, we're having our 50 Nifty United States fundraiser, and it's kind of a unique name. We've been studying the 50 states all year in co-op, so they are about, they've got about 10 left to go before May. But, um... We've kind of we've compiled a survey. It's actually posted on Facebook. We would love for you all to go take it. It'll give you a leg up for the game show if you want. Um, to, so you can see the questions beforehand. Anyway, um, but it's a family feud game show. So it's survey style. So just because you get the right answer, unless everybody else thinks it's the right answer too, then it won't necessarily be the right answer. So everybody's got a fair playing field. Um, we hope that you can come. To, we this is our last day selling tickets here at church because we do need a head count um, by tomorrow. So if you need a ticket, go ahead and see one of the kids today after church. They'd love to help you out. Um, I'm not worried about collecting money today. If you don't have money, that's okay. Call me by tomorrow morning so I can get you written down so I can count, include you in the count, okay? Um, there will be a silent auction and a live dessert auction also that night. Huh? Okay. Um, also, we'd like to invite you guys um, this Thursday at, on campus here. We're having rodeo day. Miss Sandy's going to bring her horses out, and we've got a mechanical bull. We're learning about Idaho, Wyoming, North and South Dakota, and Montana this week. So if you'd like to come out, there's a taco truck for lunch. Should be quite a fun day to watch. So if you're just sitting at home, don't sit at home. You'll have more fun here. Okay? Thank you, guys.
I didn't realize my new name was Mechanical Bull. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Children's Easter party will be this Friday, 12 o'clock here on campus. Make note of that. Our Good Friday service will be 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It will be a, uh, you never hear a pastor telling you this, but it is a shorter service, so we're not going to keep you out too late, but be here 7 o'clock. We'll have that sunrise service next Sunday, 6.30 in the morning. We'll have all those chairs out for you. I'm sure it'll be nice and warm. <laughs> never really is, is it? But we're going to be there with, uh, with bells on, ready to celebrate our resurrected Savior. Amen. Look forward to that time. Uh, normal activities of that day following the morning service. We will have the breakfast at 7 a.m. We'll have Bible study at 9 o'clock and then uh, worship service at 1030. So we invite you to be here, to bring fran friends, family, any of those who need to hear the truth about why we celebrate what we do. So let's make note of that. And the only other thing to say, it is great to be out in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand together as Trenton comes to give our call to worship this morning. Good morning, church. Today's call to worship comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, starting in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, oh, I'm so sorry, I was on the wrong one. There we go, chapter 26, starting at verse uh, 57, that is it. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is that that struck you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you have given us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your humble love towards us. We see in this passage such immense suffering that you have undergone for us as your people, and there is even more to come, as we well know with Good Friday. Father, your apostle says in the book of Philippians that we are, ought to have the same mindset of you, Christ Jesus, who though you were in the form of God, you did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But instead, you emptied yourself. You counted yourself nothing. You took on the form of a human being and that of a servant. Jesus, you have gone through such immense suffering on our behalf, and like a lamb to the slaughter, you remain silent. Thank you so much for your suffering and your death and your resurrection. Because of that, only because of that, that is how we can have eternal life and forgiveness. May we enter Holy Week this week and Good Friday and next Sunday so thankful for the love that you have poured out to us. 
And Lord, may we remember that suffering was the path to glory for you, Jesus, and that is the same for us today. May we count it joy when we encounter such sufferings, God. Please bless us in this time together and bless this week ahead. It is in your name, Christ Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Always a privilege and joy to gather for worship of our living God. And we certainly hope that you came with a heart of expectation of, in, of encountering our Lord. And may it be so. And Lord, your Holy Spirit, welcome here. This morning, right before we began with everything, I had this song planted in my heart by Pastor Ray Reed. And to help prepare us for worship this morning, I just want us to sing just our voices. We don't need words. We're standing on holy ground. And may that be our heart's desire. Let's sing it. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. Standing in his presence on holy ground. Got it? Lord, before you sing it again, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in his presence on holy ground. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. And Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a day. Father, let your will be done 
on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. And Father, let your kingdom come. Oh, Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. May that be our desire this morning. As it is in heaven, let it be so here on earth in this sanctuary as we declare the gospel and life-changing power of Jesus Christ in our lives. I search the world. together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Well, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place of no mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one you can you turn graves into goddess you turn bones into armies you turn seas in the highway, you're the only one you can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you
Revive us, Lord, if you would, for your glory. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Blessings that you give us every day. Thank you for your death on the cross, your son's death on the cross. I pray that you would make this, each of us aware of your sacrifice every day. And throughout this week, Lord, when we tell others about the risen Savior that not only died, but he rose again Amen. to cleanse all our sins, past, present, and future. Bless this offering as we come today. I ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Teresa to keep playing. I forgot the welcome this morning. You can see, you can see it all over their faces. I got so caught up in what was going on, I forgot the greeting. So stand together and greet each other and welcome to the First Baptist Church.
way back to your seat. We will continue to sing together. continue to sing now as we gather back to our pews. We win peace like a our Lord with his will be done his will be done it's well with my soul it's good with my soul Oh, wait. 
Thank you. You know, Dave, I like it when we don't do things in the correct order sometimes. It works out that way. It works out, don't it? <laughs> it works out It really does. Before I begin this morning, I see a few faces that have returned to us, and I just want to recognize. Jess, you're back from having the baby. Welcome back. <laughs> Miss Ida, it's good to see you back. Yes. And Ed, you're back with us. Funny story, you guys noticed last week, Mr. Ed had a episode. And so he's back there with the EMT and I sit next to him and I said, Ed, this is the second time that you've passed out during my sermon. <laughs> I said, you gotta stop doing this. Thinking he would just say, oh yeah, you're right, pastor, okay. He says, no, you need to get better with your sermons so I don't pass out. <laughs> Great encouragement. That being said, now that there's pressure on me, because if you go out this Sunday, I don't know what I'm going to do. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 21. And you may see your sermon notes and see, oh, we're repeating last week's sermon. Yes and no. This is a part two, but a lot of you called me during this week and said, I was wrong. And you were right. But you were also wrong. And so I want to prove that today. Because we ended last week with the assumption that we 
we alone were responsible for Jesus' death? And the answer to that question is, yes, we were. And no, we weren't. And we went through a couple episodes like CSI, and we looked at evidence to see, is it true that we killed Jesus or the Romans or the Jews? And we kind of briefly went through that and we came to the conclusion because you were my jury and you decided that we were guilty and you were right. But how do we get to that conclusion? I didn't present to you all the evidence and I did that on purpose because I knew I would get phone calls. And I did that for a reason and that is to this explain to you and give you all the evidence so that we can come to a solid conclusion. So you're at Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 39. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews... And they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him amongst themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry, And saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. And before we look at this death scene, we need to visit another death scene, unfortunately. The place was Chicago, Illinois. And the year was 1910. Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Hiller were asleep in bed when they heard a noise. Mr. Hiller got up to investigate and he encountered an armed robber in their home. There was a struggle and shots were fired. Mr. Hiller was shot twice and died as the robber fled the house. Later that morning, Chicago police arrested a parolee named Thomas Jennings. He had a gun and injuries from a scuffle. 
but he claimed he had never been near the Hiller home. But there was something that confirmed the fact that he had been there. A few years earlier, Scotland Yard had bought or brought an exhibit to the World's Fair in St. Louis. They demonstrated a new scientific way to identify criminals long after they were gone from the scene of the crime. The new crime-solving method was fingerprinting. The Chicago police had been studying this science for some time. And unfortunately for the suspect, a railing on the front porch of the Hiller's house had been freshly painted and Jennings left a clear imprint of his fingerprints in that drying paint. Thomas Jennings was the first criminal in law enforcement history to be convicted using fingerprint evidence. Having that in mind, let's visit the scene of the crucifixion and determine whose fingerprints we find at that scene. There are several suspects I'd like to introduce to you this morning. Who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? The Jews did. The religious leaders condemned Jesus to die. From the Middle Ages on, Jewish people have suffered because they have been labeled Christ killers. This has led to periods of intense anti-Semitism. During the first Christian crusade in 1096, thousands of Jews in Germany and France were killed, known as the Rhineland Massacres. While Columbus was sailing the ocean blue in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella were expelling all the Jews from Spain as part of the Spanish Inquisition. They were given a simple choice. Leave Spain or convert to Catholicism or die. And then we all know about the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler had millions of Jews killed. And part of his justification was the belief that they were Christ killers. But it's a terrible assumption to believe all Jews were responsible for the crucifixion. The Bible says multitudes of the Jews followed Jesus. His 12 disciples were Jewish. Actually, it was a very small group of religious leaders who plotted to kill Jesus. Some people call them the Jewish mafia. It's kind of a joke, but that's what they call them. The Bible says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to kill or plotted to arrest Jesus. And then in some sly way, kill him. Caiaphas was the Jewish high priest when Jew, uh, Jesus was crucified. But he was really just the puppet of his father-in-law, Annas. And Annas was the godfather of that religious mafia. Crime investigators look for three things. And those of you who are fond of those shows would probably agree with this. They look for three things. They look for motive. They look for means. And then they also look for opportunity. The Jewish mafia had all three. What was their motive? What was their plan of attack. 
This Jewish rabbi was threatening their power and their way of life. Jesus had openly challenged their hypocrisy, calling them a brood of vipers and whitewashed tombs. He said they were like the blind leading the blind. The religious mafia didn't take threats very well, like most mobs. They considered Jesus a troublemaker who had to be silenced. Did they have the means? They could have stoned Jesus. And they had tried that before, but the Jewish crowd was split. Some loved Jesus and some hated him. So that was too risky for them. Their best strategy was to have the Romans execute Jesus. That would be their means. And that was the perfect opportunity. It was the Passover festival and the Roman governor Pilate was in town. So based upon this motive, means, and opportunity, some of the leading suspects for killing Jesus had to be the Jewish religious leaders. But were they sole perpetrators? I don't think so. Let me explain. There were other fingerprints at the scene of the cross. Who killed Jesus? The Romans did. The soldiers actually crucified Jesus. The Roman soldiers were the executioners of Jesus. They were simply following the orders of their governor, Pilate. And Pilate understood that he was being used as a convenient scapegoat for the Jewish leaders. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent of any crime. But in order to pacify the Jewish leaders, he handed him over to the soldiers to be crucified. The Bible says finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And here they crucified him. Have you ever noticed the gospel narratives don't go into any detail about the crucifixion. They crucified him. Where are the details? We don't have a description of exactly what happened at the crucifixion. But there is a simple answer to that question. In the time in which the New Testament was written, every person had witnessed hundreds of crucifixions, perhaps thousands. And just the word crucify would make someone wince. None of us have ever seen a real life crucifixion. We have no frame of reference. It's been mentioned that it would be comparable to me telling you an 18-wheeler crossed the median of the highway and crashed head-on into an SUV where nobody was wearing seatbelts. I wouldn't need to describe the gory details, would I? You'd get it, right? We don't really get the agony of the crucifixion because the Bible doesn't describe it. It merely states it. We don't get our information about crucifixion from the Bible. We get it. We get it from secular historians like Herodotus and Josephus. Three centuries before Jesus' crucifixion, we learned that Alexander the Great 
had 2,000 citizens of Tyre crucified after he conquered the city. They usually just hung them on trees instead of crosses. It was the most brutal kind of execution possible. But it was shameful, and the person crucified could linger for days before they died. When the Roman general Titus was besieging Jerusalem in 70 AD, Josephus wrote that he had 500 or more Jews crucified each day for weeks. Each day for weeks. He wrote that there were not enough room for the crosses and not enough crosses for the bodies. The Romans also practiced beheading, which was a much more quicker and more merciful mode of execution. The Roman historian Seneca wrote this description of crucifixion. Can anyone be found who would prefer wasting away in pain, dying limb by limb, or letting out his life drop by drop, rather than expiring once for all? Can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree, long sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly wounds on shoulders and chest, and drawing out the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony? So the Jewish leaders are suspects. And the Roman government is the next suspect. But there are some other fingerprints at the scene of the cross. In fact, I want you to see these fingerprints. I want you to picture this in your mind. And if you need a real clear picture, hold out your finger. Hold out your finger and look at it. Who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? I did. I did. My sin was the murder weapon that killed Jesus. The reason Jesus came to planet Earth was to die for that sin so that you and I could receive Forgiveness. Had there never been any sin, there would not have been a need for the cross. And I mentioned last week about the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And we know that it's rated R for the intense depiction of his death and the violence and all those things. And I told you I won't watch it anymore. But as, as horrible as that might seem, it does not even compare to the actual flogging and crucifixion of Jesus because it was way worse than any movie could portray. In one of those scenes, Jesus is laid down on the cross and his arms are stretched out. Then you see a hand enter the frame holding a long nail and an iron hammer. This hand starts pounding the nail into the flesh of Jesus. Do you know whose hand that was? Those who are movie buffs. That was actually Mel Gibson's hand that did that. And it was a reason why he did that. There was a reason. It was his way of saying that we are the ones who sent Jesus to the cross. And you might be thinking, well, pastor, why are you bringing up Mel Gibson, who has fallen from the public eye because he was accused of domestic abuse and many other things? Why am I using him as an illustration? Um, he's one messed up guy. Well, you're exactly right. right. 
He is one messed up guy. But guess what? So am I. So am I. And so are we. We all are. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. Notice the pronouns in this verse. They are plural, but they could be singular as well. But he was pierced for our or my transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities or my iniquities. The punishment that brought us or me. Peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are, or I am, healed. I am ashamed of who I am because of my sin. We all are ashamed for that reason. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't be standing here. I'm ashamed of what I've made of my life. But praise be to God that Jesus is my answer. That Jesus is your answer Amen. to that sin. Amen. There's an old spiritual song that's often sung that asks, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, you were there and I was there. We were in the heart and the mind of Jesus as he died for our sins. Rembrandt is probably one of the most famous Dutch artists of all time. And he was a very, he was a very deeply committed follower of Christ and a Christian from the time that he was a child. He didn't need to preach the Bible. Instead, he painted many scenes from the Bible. And of course, one of his most famous paintings is called The Elevation of the Cross. It pictures the moment the soldiers are raising that cross. And you can see the hate and the anger on their faces. But Rembrandt painted himself in the picture. I don't know if you knew that. He painted himself in that picture, identified by his ubiquitous beret. It was Rembrandt's unforgettable statement that we all had a part in the crucifixion of Jesus. His fingerprints were all over the cross. So were ours. The great British pastor and theologian John Stott wrote, Before we begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Indeed, only the man who is prepared to own his share in the guilt of the cross may claim his share in its grace. Who crucified Jesus? You might say the Jewish leaders or the Roman government crucified Christ, but we also stand guilty. But when you really conduct a thorough CSI, which I call the cross scene investigation here this morning, you discover another surprising suspect. Who killed Jesus? God did. God did. He offered his son as a sacrifice for our sin. 700 years before the cross, 
The prophet Isaiah described the death of the Messiah as if he was standing in front of the cross. The Jews were looking for a military Messiah to deliver them from the Roman rule. But if they had read their own scriptures, they would have seen the Messiah would be a suffering servant. The Bible says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offering and prolong his days. Now you might be scratching your head and asking, why? Why should, or why would God send his own son to die for us? And there's a simple answer, and we know that. It's love. It's love. You've heard of a crime of passion, right? The cross was a place of passion. But it wasn't our passion. It was the loving passion of God who loved us enough to send his own son to die for us. So who killed Jesus? Jewish leaders did. The Roman government did. I did. And God did. But when it comes to that investigation, we've got to simply close the case. We have to close the case. And here's why. We close this case because when you get down to it, when you ask who killed Jesus, it's a moot point, isn't it? Because he isn't dead. Come on. He's alive. Amen. You can't have a murder trial if the supposed murder victim is alive. Peter understood this. And on the day of Pentecost, he spoke these words to the people of Jerusalem. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It's a story, an illustration that I heard while I was in seminary. And I think I've told this story to you before, but I think it's very fitting today. It's a story about a man who worked years ago as a manual operator of a railroad drawbridge over a large river. Whenever a ship would pass, he would press levers to activate giant hydraulic gears to raise the center portion of the bridge. Then when the ship passed, he would lower the bridge for trains to pass. And one day he took his young son with him to work. And the operator had raised the bridge as he was distracted. His son wandered over to an opening to look down at the massive gears that moved the bridge. And suddenly the boy lost its footing and tumbled into those gears. When the father heard his cry, and saw him among the gears, he moved to rescue him. But at that moment, he heard the whistle of an approaching passenger train. He knew the train would be full of people. And if he didn't lower the drawbridge, the train would crash into the river. There wasn't time to stop the train. So the father had an agonizing decision to make. If he rescued his son, many people would die. But if he lowered the bridge, his son would certainly be crushed in those huge gears. With a broken heart 
and tears filling his eyes, the operator advanced the lever to lower the bridge and it returned to level. The train passed by with passengers laughing and dining, never knowing the sacrifice that had been made for them to live. Now, when I heard that story, I immediately think of my kids and what would I do? It was probably the best story to illustrate the crucifixion of Christ that I'd ever heard. But I've since matured then. And now I realize that the story falls far short of the wonder of the cross. First of all, there's no record of that ever happening. And even if it was told as a parable, it is still a poor illustration because the drawbridge operator didn't make his decision based on love. He did it reluctantly. And he hated his decision. I'm sure I would have felt the same way. God so loved the world that you and I, that he gave his only son to die for us. And he did it willingly. He did it all out of love. Not thinking about what he was giving up, but for what we could gain. The cross was not a sudden decision God had to make. It wasn't as if the heavenly father was faced with a dilemma. My son or the world? No, the Bible says in Revelation 13, 8, that Jesus is the lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. Peter writes, he was chosen to be our sacrifice before creation. The cross wasn't an afterthought. It has been in the heart and mind of God from the beginning of the beginning. But finally, the reason God could allow his son to die on the cross was because he knew all along that death couldn't hold him. Every time that we sin, Every time we sin, it's like adding weight to Jesus on that cross. Every time. Every time you and I sin, it's like climbing up on Jesus as he hangs on that cross and adding weight, causing the nails in his hands to pull harder and cause him more pain. It's like yanking on the feet and causing the blood to flow more freely. Every time we sin, it's like sitting on Jesus. Who really killed Jesus? We did. We did. Our sin brought him from heaven, nailed him to that cross, and our continued sin is like the crown of thorns or the spear in his side, just adding more pain, inflicting more injury. So here we have the whole motley crew, all of the guilty parties, all who conspired and worked together hand in hand to kill Jesus, the Jews, Judas, Pilate, Satan, and us. But the guilty party who really killed Jesus is not there. Well, we can't see him. He is hiding behind these ones we normally blame. So we need to remove those co-conspirators and let us get a picture of the real person who killed Jesus. Yes, it was us. Yes, it was the Romans. Yes, it was the Jews. And believe it or not, it was not even Satan who killed Jesus. 
Of course, he instigated the whole thing. He was working since before creation to get back at God. He had tried to kill Jesus as a child, and he was the power that motivated every guilty person in the passion. But even Satan did not have the power to take Jesus' life. Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. I lay it down. So who is left? God. God. Jesus' very own Father. It's the time of season, so I get to bring in a baseball illustration. If you follow baseball, you probably know the story I'm telling you. But there was a baseball bought several years ago for $140,000. And it was the baseball that was interfered by a fan and cost, supposedly cost the Chicago Cubs their first World Series in many, many, many years. And it was a hated baseball. And that poor fan, most hated man in Chicago and many other places. But a fan bought that ball for $140,000 and he paid all that money just so he could destroy the ball. And hopefully, as we've seen in recent years, the curse is no longer on that team. And on TV one morning, he took that ball and he blew it to smithereens. Someone asked him, was it worth it? Today, if we could ask God, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Do you know what he would say? Ah, it depends. It depends on what we do. It depends on what we do. If we recognize our sin, we recognize that we are hopeless and that we are in a hopeless condition. And we understand that Jesus paid the price and now we can have forgiveness of those sins and have eternal and abundant life. And if we come and confess our sinfulness, confess that we are powerless to change and to do anything to atone for those sins. And if we ask Jesus to forgive us our sins and save our soul, then it was worth it all. But if we leave here today unchanged, still trapped in those sins, still separated from God by those sins, still condemned to death because of those sins, and don't come to Jesus and fall down in submission to him and find salvation, it was a waste. Forget that millions have been saved and forgiven. If just one, you, 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 if just one does not find the forgiveness, the joy, the peace, and the victory over sin, it is as if, if Jesus died for nothing. What about you? Can we admit to ourself and to God that we have sinned? Are we sorry for the sin and the things it has ruined in our life? Do we want to be forgiven and have the Spirit of God as our constant companion? Do we want joy and happiness to take the place of despair and failure? then I have two words for you today. Come today. Come today. Just stand up, get out of the pew, and come to the cross. Walk to the front. Kneel at the cross. 
and we close the investigation because there was never a body available for an autopsy. As many will be singing next week, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. Waiting for the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Amen? Dave. Stand together, please. And it all culminates to let us bow before him to know that he is a holy God. Amen. Let's sing together as we close the service. You are. Heavenly Father, as we approach this holy of holiest weeks, may we remember the sacrifice you gave for us through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, even though it's a story and some say it's a fable or a myth, Lord, we know the truth. We rejoice in that truth. We understand what it meant to go to that cross and what the cost was. Lord, we all sent you there, but you did it willingly. You didn't have to think twice. You did it all for love. Thank you for that love you have for us and all the people that you've called to be in your kingdom. And Lord, as we meditate this week and we think about your last week here on earth, Lord, that we know that it's not the end of the story. It is merely the beginning. And we look forward to the day when we can celebrate with you hand in hand. Lord, we're excited for that. We look forward to that day. And until then, we follow your calling. We tell others the wonderful news of the man 
the God, the Christ who came to give it all for them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week.